Nearly 15 years ago, we were spending a lot of time in Willits Point, an extremely noisy, volatile, smelly environment in Queens. And today we're back together talking about that incredible experience uh, in a much nicer environment, but I think we'll still hear a lot of honking and trucks backing up because we are in Greenpoint, in an industrial area. Very close to where we filmed Ale against the Manhattan skyline. Yes. This film actually came together relatively quickly compared to your first film, Man Push Cart, which was very long in the planning. I had a goal or an anxiety because Kiara Stemi, the director I admire, told me, if you make a movie, your first movie, make the second movie very quickly. Don't delay. So I just thought to myself, it must be the way you got to do it. It must have been in early 2005, where Michael Simmons, the cinematographer, called me and said, I'm heading out to Willits Point to get my car fixed. I think you should come. And I had heard about this place, but I had never been there. And went out there, looked around, and was like, okay, well, this is pretty obvious. The next movie has to get made here in Willis Point. It existed across the street from, at that time, Shea Stadium, the tennis stadium. The airport was on the other side of the water. I just didn't think anyone would believe it was New York. And once Man Pushcart finished, I just camped out there. I was just going there every day. This is also the film where you started your collaboration with Bahare Azimi as your your co-screenwriter, and she's continued to be a really important creative partner for you. Azimi, which I call her by her last name, she lives in Paris, she's an Iranian, raised in France, who right now runs a film school, does documentaries. At that time, she wasn't a trained writer, and we had connected in the late 90s because of our Iranian background and our interest in Kiara Stemi's cinema and other kinds of movies. I told her the idea and showed her some photographs I'd taken of the location, at that time, the idea was about a kid and his mom. And she quickly said, I think it would be better if it was a kid, a boy and his sister, because we've seen it less. So I just said, I, I got to write this thing fast. Can I convince you to co-write the script? And can you come to New York for like two weeks? And for two weeks, we just write a script. And that's what we did. And then the fact that Man Pushcart went to Venice and was acclaimed allowed you to access financing much more quickly. Man Push Car took two years to raise that money from about 26 people. So it was a long, hard process. Uh, Man Push Car fortunately started to do well on the, in the festival circuit. It was winning prizes. And I was able to convince a handful of those investors to give us a couple hundred thousand dollars. So my intention was to just make the movie with whatever money we had. I had accumulated a few interns or casting assistants led by this wonderful woman, Mirna Moncayo. And um, we were looking for kids. We just started the casting process, which was going to playgrounds, trying to go to schools. I found one person who knew a principal of a school in lower Manhattan, and he allowed us to go in there. He had a contact at two other schools that led to two more schools. And by the end, we had probably went to like, I don't know, 100 schools. Um, we put I think 2,500 kids on tape. And it was all being done with a pressure to make the movie like seven months later. Um, I remember in late 2005, I found a Cassavetes on Cassavetes interview book. And he talked about how he would just set an arbitrary date to start a movie, even though he didn't have the story or anything or no money. And he would gather people and work towards that date. So I thought I should do the same thing. We were just marching forward towards a movie that I didn't know what it was yet. And at a certain point, you met Ale. Um, Ale, do you remember your audition and what your first encounter with Ramin was like? It was funny because um, one of our school counselors came up to me and they're like, um, there's a director here, you want to try it for a movie? And I'm like, I mean, I wouldn't mind. So, he shows up at, um, at lunchtime, and I'm sitting down. I mean, I'm not, not even paying mind to this guy. I'm literally just, you know, interacting with my friends. And um, they're like, um, go speak to him, you know, just talk with him. And I, I don't know exactly what happened before I got up or if it was when I was going back to the table, but he pointed to something on the floor. The goal in going to the schools was 
if you were lucky, you would not go when they had class. You would go in lunchtime because you could see the kids more in their natural way as opposed to silently sitting at a table. So I, saw, I got to him at lunch. As an 11-year-old, he, he had four upper-class women totally kind of in awe. He was telling a story. And these four, like, I don't know, 14-year-olds were just kind of gaping at him like he was a <laughs> king. And um, so I was already amazed that he had the ability to charm people and to tell a story, whatever he was doing. And I noticed there was a catch-up. That's what it was. And you kept moving your foot as you were talking to these, um, to these women, these young girls. And um, I thought you were going to hit it with your foot by accident and it would make a mess. And I, I asked, I said, what's his name? They said, uh, Ale, I said, I said, Ale, you looked at me from like, I don't know, 10, 20 feet away. And I pointed to your foot, to the ketchup. You saw it, you picked it up, you threw it in the trash, you came back and you continued the story to those girls. And I just thought to myself, my God, he takes direction with no <laughs> dialogue, which I don't like to talk. I like to, on set, I don't call action and cut his almond nose mm -hmm. and you came to learn. Correct. I like to gesture and I like it to be more intuitive. He did that, he didn't break, and I thought to myself, this might be the kid. The other key part of this story <clears throat> was Ithamar was in your school, actually. She was by chance in his school. Correct. And I remember walking by in the hallway and I saw her and I was like, yeah. Man, she has an interesting face. And so I made sure we got her name and we tried to get her to come to the audition. And she was good on camera, she was good in the improvisation. It turned out they knew each other. Yeah. The connection that me and Ismael had already is like brother and sister thing, you know what I'm saying? But she was always into dancing, I was into dancing, so we were performing the school as well together. We already had that bond. So when they brought her in, you know, it's like a walk in the park because it's like we already have that relationship together that we don't mind acting as brother and sister because we are practically brother and sister, you know? So I just feel like it would have not worked with anybody else. Weirdly, it was your school also that we had convinced to let us use a room on the weekends to do mm -hmm. auditions. Yep. But what was awesome was, in that experience, we basically rehearsed the whole movie. I never showed Alejandro or Izzy or anybody the script. I would just tell them what the scenes were, and then they would start to improvise, and we would tape all these improvisations. And I would go home at night, and I would rewrite the script based on interesting things they said, and he was great at improvisation. And that's some um, fake gold. What about them sneakers down there, like? Oh, these sneakers are official. Don't play with my sneakers. No. Yes, they are. So pick up, let me see the jeans. Are you going to go for a dance? So let me see them. Let me see them. Hello. Let me see them. Yeah. He was smart. He was fast. He was witty. He was funny. So oftentimes, he would make the scenes better. He would add things. He would change things. He would come in and tell us, all right, just, you know, act like you guys buy a food truck and this and that. And just a simple little breakdown of what, you know, he wants to see. And we just connected with each other. And it was just amazing the way we were working. I called you a few times and I got worried because you weren't there. So when in this process did you guys start going to Willits Point together? I took him out the first time and introduced him to people and he was kind of absorbing it. I remember you liked cars. Your yeah, uncle, yeah. I think, was a mechanic mm -hmm. or worked on cars mm -hmm. with you. And um, most of the movies I made had an angel. The big guy, Ahmed Razvi, he was the angel of Man Push Cart. Like, the movie wouldn't have existed without him. Mm -hmm. Not just because of his acting and his, you know, our friendship, but he arranged so many things. Locations, people. Rob was the angel of Chop Shop. Rob, who was the garage owner and plays himself in the movie, I used to go there for weeks and weeks, and I don't have a car. So it's kind of unusual. Why is there a guy wandering <laughs> around? And eventually, Rob saw me one time, and he said, come over here. He said, what are you doing? And I told him what I told every other person I talked to. I said, I'm a student at Hunter College, and my dumb professor told me I need to write a story about this place, and I'm just trying to figure out what that story would be. And everyone believed that and found it boring. And that was great, because then they wouldn't ask me any more questions, and I could ask them the mm -hmm. questions. Rob was the first one who said bullshit. He just said bullshit. <laughs> what are you doing? I said, I want to make a short film here. He said, no. I said, I want to make a movie here. He's like, you're going to make it right here in my garage. <laughs> <laughs> and he had the perfect garage. I mean, just luck. And on the second floor was his office. 
And I looked at it and I said, it's a tree house. Mm -hmm. If I was a 12 year old kid and I came here and I saw that, I'd be like, this is the best place you could ever want to live. So then Rob became a huge part of the movie and provided so many kind of details. You know, I would be like, how much are stolen hubcaps? And he would inform us. Rob, if you're in the film. Rob is Tony. That was the name of the guy in the film, but if you were in it, your name would be Rob. What was great about Rob was you and Rob got along, and Rob started paying Alejandro to basically to work in the garage. Yep. It started off with a little camera. Every time we went over there, it was a little handheld camera that would yeah. go over there. And it was like people were watching, you know? People were looking and, you know, what's going on? After a while, it was just, I'm doing exactly what you guys are doing. I'm just bringing cars in, you know? And Rob is like, all right, I'm gonna give you five bucks per car. After a while, I'm like, you, you really start looking for things that's wrong on a car. Does this car have a cracked windshield? Does it, does it need a mirror, you know? So when it was time to shoot, it was like, forget about it. They just brought in a bigger camera. I was doing the same thing, you know? So it was summertime, I'm 12 years old. I'm making five bucks a car. You know, I'm bringing in a lot of cars. And then Rob was, I mean, I, I feel like he was throwing in extra on top, you know, just because he's seen I was really out there, you know, trying to do the right thing. During school, he was there on the weekends. Once summer started, he was there every day. Every day. And there were certain days <laughs> there was no one to take you, and he would get very upset that he couldn't make money that day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he was there so long that all the people around there, they didn't really understand that we were making a fiction movie. They thought we were making a documentary, a documentary yeah. about Rob and Alejandro. We were shooting it, but to them it was like he's taking away a car. Yeah. But it was true, I mean. Oh, of course it was true. They were going to lose money. I was, I was losing money. They were losing money. It, I was losing money. If you didn't get if it. I didn't get the car inside well, the house garage. That's a very, that's a <laughs> point that has to be made clear, which is Like Man for Scar was a non-SAG, non-union movie. What are you doing tonight, kid? Nothing. I got some guys coming over. We're going to hang out. Why don't you come by and give me a hand? How much you pay? There's a very beautiful, though problematic, relationship between Ahmed and Ale's character. I say problematic because Ahmed is probably a bad influence in the film yeah. on Ale. But it's very powerful, and I'm wondering how much of a real relationship of, I don't know whether it would be mentor and mentee, but how your relationship was with you know a guy who'd already been through the Ramin Barani School of Filmmaking. <laughs> Just off jump, when I meet this cool guy, right, slick back hair, right? I'm like, this is gonna be the dude who's gonna teach me how to drive. <laughs> I said, all these guys are not gonna do it because they're not gonna wanna teach me. I mean, and that was just off the jump, we just got a great relationship and he just, you know, put me under the wing, you know, and just basically showed me the ropes and told me what Rami likes and what he doesn't like. And it was just a, a great mentor, man. A, just, you know, a great guy to have around on set as well some times that uh, when I was on the set and even when it wasn't my day of shoot or scenes I would still come down there just to help out just to do whatever I can and normally that like we did man push card you know and there's a point where you said to me dude you got to get this kid to calm down in between the scenes and takes and that's when I would come to Ali I was like Ali come here let me teach you a few things I told him how to drive was it my car I think it was it was your car in the beginning. Yeah, it was a white Jaguar or yeah. something like that. And then all he wanted to do was just go fast. And I'm like, look, dude, you have to do this. I'm like, don't mess up my car. I know we're in a, we're in a, we're in a chop shop where we can repair the car, but just don't mess it up. Ahmed, there's a really nice thing about you in the film. Somehow you really integrate real life into the movie. There's no separation. And I remember specifically that you kept your phone on mm -hmm. while you were filming mm -hmm. and that you had that great nightcrawler <laughs> ringtone that we would hear once in a while and that's in the film. And you were conducting business in other places while being in the film, but I think it really serves the film because you're this guy who's just doing a million things in this crazy environment and it fits. At that time when we were doing Chop Shop, I was still doing construction. We still had family businesses as well and I was back and forth and hustling here and there. During the time, I mean, Man Push Card happened. The film went everywhere. And uh, my father's like, okay, so where's the money? <laughs> it, you know, we got yeah. acclaimed and everything. But, you know, being a um, son of a, of a businessman, they look at that, of course, it's like the taboo. It's like, what are you doing in this industry? So I still had to maintain my work. So at that time, when we were doing Chop Shop, you know, he didn't really know that I'm going to a set or acting again. I would just escape whenever I could. 
and still keep my business. <laughs> so of course, the nightcrawler <laughs> tone and the phone had to be on. Yo, Dizzy, what's up? I remember learning through Man Pushka, like whatever happens, stay to your, stay in your character. Yeah. Whatever happens, you know. So it was just a improv onto and like, yeah. all right, just get it done, you know, stay in character and move on. Yeah, we had no control over no. the situation that we were in. I mean, you can't begin to try to exert control over a place like the Willips Point junkyard auto body shop world. And so we just had to be constantly on every level, production like the actors, ready to go for it. I mean, I remember at one point, suddenly we had to change plans and we were gonna film Ale, like Michael was gonna you know, walk backwards, filming Ale walking down the whole main drag of, of Willits Point. And that was a decision that was made like this. And I forgot to inform the sound department that that was happening. And so they didn't speak to me for three days. You know, it's like <laughs> things were, we just had to move so fast. Yeah. Like, it, it, it was not a normal film set. It, at that time, I had no, I couldn't understand why they were so frustrated that it was so chaotic. Now, when I look back, I understand, but it couldn't have been done any other way. Yeah. If you tried to control it, you would lose. Yo, yeah, what you think about this place? It's all right. It's all right. They got the best movie here. Lila, what is she doing here? I don't know. I'm gonna find out. Sometimes we were filming people who didn't know they were being filmed, but sometimes we had to get background. For yeah. instance, there's the scene in the only restaurant in Willis Point, the diner, one night, and we needed people to be in that diner. And we had to keep them for three or four hours while we did our 20 or 30 takes. And these are people who have been working in Willis Point all day. I mean, it's brutal. They have no desire to be in a movie. They do not care about cinema. Mm -hmm. That night, I had to get on the phone with one guy's <laughs> wife <laughs> and tell her that he was not cheating on her. He was actually being in a movie in Willits Point. <laughs> and then the rumor went around that there was another guy who wanted to kill me. Because as the AD, it's my job to keep people. So, you know, we would do a shot and everybody would be like, okay, we're going home. And I'd go around like, no, please, one more shot, I beg you. And one guy apparently, I went too far and he got really <laughs> upset. But I'm still here to talk about it. But... <laughs> We got through it, though. Yes. And then the movie went to Cannes. It went to the director's fortnight. Yeah. And Abbas Kiarostami was there. And Yeah. I remember going back to Man Push Card in 2005. It had premiered in Venice. And then maybe the next festival, Kiarostami was there. And he saw Man Push Card there, and he really liked it. But he had one thing he wanted me to think about for Chop Shop. And he said, Man Push Card has one feeling for most of the movie, one kind of tone. And he said, life is more like an orchestra where it has slow, fast, sad, happy, different rhythm. He said, see if you can bring a little bit of that into the new one. And I thought, oh, OK, this is a good suggestion. <laughs> so we go to Cannes. And I remember I turned around to someone. And I said, oh, my god. And it was, it was Kiarostami who was sitting right behind me. I remember in the middle of the movie, he squeezed my shoulder. I was like, oh, OK, he must like it. Well, once the movie finished, I mean, the light went on. They gave a hug to each other. And it was like, I'm there looking over them <laughs> like, hey. Like. I stood you up on the chair so people could see you and clap for you. That was amazing, amazing now, experience. Ali, how do you look back on the character that you played in the film today? I was actually very sad watching it because I was really struck by how young you and Izzy were, and the harshness of the hustling life that you were living. So I'm wondering how maybe you thought of it at that time, and now how you look back at it. When we first got to Willis Point, I mean, there was another little kid that actually lived it. Two little. They're both in the film. So it's like, I'm here playing around with it, but this is somebody's life, you know? So when they broke it down to me like that, like, you know, these kids actually live in those garages and, you know, look, when we get here at 6 in the morning, they're lifting the gate and they're coming outside there. When I realized it, I said, damn, you know, this is really messed up, you know, but when my character that I played, it's like, these are some things in life that people have to go through and, you know, some are fortunate than others that they don't have to go through. Come on! 
it's amazing how much that movie really made me the person who I am today. I, I, I would definitely say that because 12 years old, you had a baseline where it's like you're trying to be a teenager, but you're still a kid, right? So when I was given all these responsibilities, like waking up at six in the morning and going to a shop and, you know, we have to catch this before the sun goes down or I have to hustle in a car, you know, to, to get my money for Rob or whatever the case may be. It's like it, all, it gave me responsibilities. I'm sanding, I'm priming, I'm painting and doing the letters. But my name is going on that pen. All right, all right. It's going like this. My name is going diagonally. Your initials can maybe go like right here. Initials? Come on. Yeah. Mm. All right, all right. Easy. That's it. And no. you actually do have your own business now, and you actually have your own truck. So I do run a mobile car wash in New York City. Um, I come to, you know, any you, you, barbershop, you could be sitting down at a nice restaurant eating, or I need my car clean, you know? It's, I'm right outside, I'm washing your car, so it's like... You just did a contract with Amazon. You correct. A whole fleet of Amazon. A whole fleet of Amazon, which Holy. was 60 vehicles. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just feel like... Um, overwhelmed sometimes, you know, because it's, it's so much on my plate, but people complain when they have so much on their plate, and then people complain when you have nothing to eat, you know? So which one would you rather? That's the borderline where I'm at right now. So it's like, keep striving, keep striving, and just try to be great, you know? I think that's what life is about, man. But did you write your name on your van? That's no. <laughs> Why not? Now you could do it. It could be. I didn't do it. I was mean, it was it easy and all there? Was it all it is? Well, that was That's the a whole big question. Debate. That was the whole question right there. <laughs> <laughs> whose name was gonna go first? Yeah. And who counts the money? <laughs> <laughs>